Hey folks, so today we are going to be talking about perennial crops. <clears throat> These are the long-lived uh, crops that are kind of adjacent to all of the annual crops that we grow in the garden. So a perennial plant is, the, the, name, com the name basically means through the years, and that name is used to differentiate uh, these plants, perennials, from shorter-lived annuals and biennials. Annuals live less than a year. They go through their whole life cycle in less than a year, and biennials are basically annuals that um, do their reproductive cycle the following year. So perennial crops include all the fruit trees, apples, pears, the stone fruits, which are cherries, plums, peaches, apricots, and nectarines. It includes nut trees, walnut, pecan, hazelnut, chestnut, etc. All the cane fruits. So these are things like blackberries, raspberries. Um, then there's the berries that grow on shrubs, blueberries, currants, gooseberries, uh, woody vines like grapevines and kiwis. Um, includes strawberries and some other vegetables like asparagus, rhubarb, and most culinary herbs. And I'm sure you guys can think of a lot more plants that would fit into that category. So the thing that I really like about perennials is they generally require less effort and resources to grow overall um, because there isn't tillage um, and you're not replanting every year. Uh, so there is some extra work to plant trees versus planting uh, a bed of vegetables. But the, that extra work that you put in, if there is extra work, it's paid back uh, in time with that continued harvest because you plant a tree and it lives for years or decades or a lifetime as opposed to, uh, you know, an annual vegetable that you plant and then you harvest. Uh, perennial crops they can be more sustainable because not only are you not tilling the soil and burning up all the carbon dioxide, uh, burning up the, the carbon in the plant and putting it up in the atmosphere by tilling the soil, but you're also holding the soil together, preventing soil erosion. And perennial crops sometimes use less water and fertilizers than annual crops also. Some examples, you got your apples and pears, you got your stone fruits, and uh, these are what are called aggregate fruits, which include raspberries, blackberries, and strawberries. Those are aggregate fruits, what used to be called compound fruits. Um, and that's a different category than the cane fruits. Cane fruits are blackberries and raspberries specifically that grow on kind of tall canes. Uh, Marion berries, boysenberries, they fit into that category too. And then don't forget about the nuts. You got uh, on the top, you got walnuts, you got pecans, down below you got uh, hazelnuts and chestnuts. And there's a bunch of others I'm sure that you guys can think of. And it's not just fruits and nuts. So perennials, um, some perennials are grown for edible shoots like asparagus, for stems like rhubarb, leaves like the perennial kale in the bottom right, and shoots or leaves like a lot of the culinary herbs, and then a lot of the ornamental flowers are perennials, um, and so on and so on. So because they live for years and years, perennials need a little bit different care than annual crops. So one thing that they do need is that periodic feeding uh, with uh, some kind of compost, fertilizer, or mulch. Now, if we remember, compost is kind of a complete fertilizer for plants because it does have some of the nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. It's also building organic matter in the soil and increasing the soil's ability to hold nutrients and water. 
Um, and then mulch can break down and compost if we're talking about organic mulch, like um, straw, grass, leaves, wood chips. That will break down essentially into compost there in place and provide some nutrients to the plants. Now, usually mulch alone is not enough. Usually you need either a, a, a really rich compost or a compost fertilizer mix or a mulch fertilizer mix for real health and longevity for your crops. Um, but they need that periodic feeding. Uh, with annual crops, most of the nutrition is going to be present in the soil. So that's the bed preparation that you've done. Whereas with perennial crops, because they are growing and producing year after year, you have to get on a regular routine of feeding them, usually once, twice, maybe more times per year. And uh, some farmers will coordinate that with either the budding time or the flowering time to make sure that the plant has adequate nutrition for producing fruit or whatever uh, the edible portion of the plant is. And um, a lot of perennial crops do need consistent and thorough harvesting. Uh, a lot of perennial crops you don't want to over harvest. Now it depends on what what's being produced, and we're gonna talk about that. The consistent and thorough harvesting is more for fruiting crops. The not over harvesting is more for the non-fruiting crops. Something that is different for these perennial crops um, as opposed to annuals is pruning, okay? So normally we're not pruning annual crops, but with perennials, we are doing several different types of pruning depending on what the crop is. There's structural pruning, there's vegetative, and there's seasonal pruning. And again, this is only with some uh, perennial crops, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And lastly, uh, you need to pay attention to proper pollination in fruiting crops. And we will talk about that a little bit later too. But basically, when you have trees, fruit trees, um, you need both pollinizers and pollinators. And we will talk about that. So, periodic feeding and mulching. This is something that we don't have to worry about with annual crops, but we do with perennials. And the main thing to understand with perennials, these are bigger plants usually, and we want to understand where the drip line is with the plant. So you can see on this graphic on the left, the drip line of the tree over here. That's basically where if it's raining on the tree, that outer edge of the canopy of the plant or the tree, that outer edge, if you draw a line straight down to the earth, that's the drip line. This is where you're going to have a concentration of feeder roots around the plant underground. So this is where we wanna feed and mulch the plant and water it, is right around here. Now, as far as mulch, we can mulch pretty close to the trunk. You don't actually wanna get right up against the trunk, and you can see that in the top left, the image in the top left, uh, this person is pulling the mulch away from the very base of the tree. You don't wanna pile mulch up at the very base of the tree because that can cause uh, rot and diseases and insects attacking the plant right at the very base. But other than that, you can mulch the tree right out to the drip line. The trees actually really appreciate it. Then you don't have to mow that area and you don't have to be driving on the plant's roots with the lawnmower. You can just drive around it and, uh, and not be driving your uh, machines or walking on the roots of the plant. So this is a really good idea with, uh, with perennial fruit trees and things. And again, this is where we wanna be feeding them. We're not throwing the fertilizer up against the trunk of the plant. The feeder roots are around the drip line and that's where we wanna be placing our fertilizers, our compost, and then uh, mulch over that whole area. That's ideal. Uh, again, feed and water the drip line. Uh, mulching with wood chips with most perennials is a good thing. Not all wood chips are created equal. Some are better for certain plants than others, so you wanna research that. 
But uh, wood chips are long-lived mulch, and they are usually great for perennials. And you want to avoid walking on the roots of your perennial crops. The less that you can do that, the better those crops will do. Okay, now con thorough consistent harvest of fruiting crops can increase the life of the plant, the lifespan, and it can also reduce pests. Uh, now, depending on what your crop is and when a normal harvest is, um, it can reduce the amount of energy that the plant is putting into that crop, especially if you're picking those fruits a little bit premature before all of the energy of the plant has gone into the seed. Um, but generally, the bigger impact is that we don't want these fruits to be falling on the ground, rotting, and in encouraging and inviting insects and other pests of your particular crop. Because what's going to happen is if the, the rotting fruit attracts them, then pretty soon they're laying their eggs on the fruit that's on the plant. And then you have uh, you have different fruit maggots and things uh, attacking the fruit when it's still on your plant, still on the tree. And you don't want that. So good sanitation, cleaning up old fallen fruits around uh, perennial fruiting crops, always a good thing. That's going to benefit your crop a lot. With certain crops, we do want to not over harvest. We want to be careful of over harvesting. And so with if we go back with fruiting crops, the fruit is the reproductive uh, next generation of the crop. So the crop wants to produce that fruit and it wants to let it go. It's a little bit different with leaf shoot and stem crops. Right here we have asparagus, uh, we have French sorrel, which is the sour plant that you guys probably recognize from the front garden. And we have rhubarb. And these are these are energy producing parts of the plant. Unlike the fruits, which are uh, reproducing parts of the plant, the, the shoots, the leaves, and the stems are all part of the, that plant producing leaves and photosynthesizing. So if we harvest every asparagus shoot that comes up, then the plant won't be able to build up new energy for the following year. Same thing if we eat every leaf off of the French sorrel or harvest every rhubarb stem. And even if we harvest a bunch of them, we can still uh, hurt the plant or slow it down in its growth. So with the non-fruiting plants, it's a balance. You want to harvest uh, the right amount to keep the plant um, growing new leaves keep the plant growing new shoots, and um, obviously get your, get your food value out of your crop, but you don't want to harvest so much that you're going to stunt your plant and slow it down. Okay, pruning. Pruning. So pruning is a whole big thing, as you can see here. <clears throat> um, there are volumes and volumes of books written on pruning, uh, but just to simplify it a little bit, I break it up into three different types of pruning. There's structural pruning. And structural pruning is cutting buds and branches so that the plant's frame is strong enough that it can hold the weight of fruit on the plant, um, or maybe hold the weight of people climbing up in the trees to pick fruit, or just basically so that the structure of the plant is really strong. Um, we can also do structural pruning if we're trying to train that plant to grow on a trellis or a fence line or some other kind of support system for it. But it's structural. We're, we're pruning with the intention that the plant will be strong and um, the branches won't break for any number of reasons, including the fruit weighing a lot on the branches. There's vegetative pruning. So this means cutting back plants specifically to encourage new shoots and new leaves. Um, one thing that people do this with is asparagus. Uh, once, if the shoots aren't harvested and they leaf out and they kind of produce these fern-like fronds, eventually you'll want to cut those back 
to encourage new shoot growth. Um, there's a lot of other perennial plants, especially ornamentals, that are cut back vegetatively just to encourage new, new leaves to grow, new vegetation. That's why it's called vegetative pruning. And then the last kind of pruning is seasonal pruning. And this is usually done annually, and it's specifically to encourage the formation of food producing parts of the plant. So with apples, there's certain ways that you cut the growing tips to encourage uh, fruit spurs, which are these little short branches that make a lot of flowers and make a lot of fruit. Um, and there's other types of plants that you would prune in this way, but it's seasonal pruning is specifically to to encourage the plant to make more fruit. Okay, pollination. It's not just a buzzword. <laughs> um, pollination is required for a lot of these fruit and crops. And you gotta know your crops. Here is a short little list of uh, who when it, when it says self-fertile, that means you can plant one tree and it will produce fruit. If it requires a pollinizer, that means you have to plant at least one other tree um, of that same species to pollinate, to cross-pollinate. So a cherry needs another cherry tree around, requires a pollinizer. Japanese plums, they require another plum uh, to cross-pollinate uh, and make fruit, okay? Now, what's the difference between a pollinizer and a pollinator? Ooh, I'll show you right here. Top left, that's a pollinator. That's a honeybee. Bottom left, that is a pollinizer. That's another tree of the same species. So a pollinizer is a tree that can cross-pollinate with your tree and a pollinator is the insect that does the work, right? So annuals, they are mainly grown from seed, but perennials, what we're talking about today, they are often propagated by other means. So some of them are grown from seed, but uh, a lot of perennials are grown by these other systems of propagation. So we're talking about cuttings, stem cuttings, we're talking about runners, which can be either stem uh, runners, which would go over the ground, or rhizome runners, which go under the ground and then pop up. Uh, they can be divisions, which are bulbs that uh, make separate little plants right next to the base, or they can be rhizomes, which are like an underground stem that can make other plants. Um, they can be propagated from grafting, which is like plant surgery. And they can be propagated by layering and air layering, which uh, this picture behind the, the text here, this is a picture of layering. It's basically when you have a plant, like a tree branch, and you lay that tree branch so that it, it's laying down, touching the dirt, and you usually have some way of pinning it down or making sure that it's it stays touching the dirt. And then the branch can grow up after that. And where it's touching the ground, it can make roots. And after a while, if it makes enough roots, you can actually cut it separate from the mother plant over here and, uh, and then make a new plant out of that, make a new tree, a baby tree. That's called layering. So let's look at some of these. Stem cuttings. Uh, stem cuttings, it, all these crops are propagated in different ways, just like they're all harvested in different ways. Uh, but there are kind of some basic things with taking cuttings. When you're taking a stem cutting, usually you're gonna cut it with clean pruners you're gonna take off all the leaves except for just a couple small ones on the top. Sometimes you're even gonna cut those in half to decrease the amount of evaporation so the stem doesn't dry out. And then you're immediately gonna stick it in some, some uh, damp soil. And if, it's, if it takes, it takes. 
right down here you can see this is a grape vine cutting and it's made some nice lovely roots and you could take that and put it in a nice big pot or even plant it directly in the ground and a lot of uh, plants can be propagated this way you just got to learn uh, what does well from cuttings uh, up here i have a short list figs grapes currants mulberries cane fruits like uh, blackberries and raspberries and many many more Uh, propagation from runners okay so runners remember there are two different kinds of runners there are stem runners and there's rhizome runners stem runners are kind of run over the surface and rhizome runners run under the ground so right here this is an example of a rhizome runner these are raspberries and this person has just dug up one of these raspberries that popped up next to the raspberry plant they dug up and they found the root underground and they cut it uh, away from the main plant, but got a bunch of the roots that were underground attached to the the above ground shoot, and they pot put it, um, they potted it up, and now they have a new raspberry plant. And that can they could give that to their neighbor or plant a new raspberry plant somewhere else. And then over here on the right, we have strawberry plant runners. So I'm guessing some of you guys have probably seen these. If you weeded the strawberries at the high school at the front garden um, they they look like little branches or stems and they run over the ground and where they touch the ground they will make new roots and what you can do is you can actually break this away from the mother plant right there and then plant this in a little pot or in some new ground and that will make a new strawberry plant and so these are above ground runners, these are below ground runners, or stem and rhizome runners. Next, we're going to talk about divisions. So up here, this little drawing right here, you can see the basic idea of divisions, which is not really a scientific term, but it's basically you're going to take a plant that grows in a clump and you're going to kind of separate them out without destroying. The individual plants and then you can plant those and get a bunch of plants out of what was originally one so up here you can see plant cluster it's uh you're dividing it up and making sure every plant has above ground and below ground parts some shoots and some roots and then you can plant those individually and you can turn that one plant into four in this case so right here this is doesn't look like much, but this is a, a clump of asparagus. Underground, all of these stumps are connected. There's a rhizome underground, a rhizome system. <clears throat> and so what you can do is you can carefully cut this into several chunks and make several asparagus plants, start several new clumps of asparagus plants uh, out of this one. Now, if you leave those to grow for years and years and you take care of them, they will become clumps this size themselves and then they can be further divided up and you could make acres of asparagus from this one plant. Um, this down here on the left is uh, the sour plant again, the French sorrel that we have growing in the front. That grows really easy from divisions. Um, you could dig up one of those plants in the front garden and probably make 15 plants out of one of those. And usually with divisions, like you see with this asparagus, usually when you're taking divisions, you do want to cut the above ground part of the plant uh, off. Leave, leave a little stump, like maybe a couple inches of stem, but um, cut most of that leaf off. Just like when we're doing cuttings, it reduces the evaporation so the, the actual living part of the plant doesn't dry out. Um, and then on the bottom right here, this looks kind of weird, but what we're looking at, this is a clump of rhubarb. And this is in the spring. So everything died back over the winter and in the spring, it's just starting to bud out and produce new rhubarb leaves for the spring. And what you can do is dig up this whole clump um, and divide it up into chunks. Make sure every chunk has one of these growing buds and be really careful not to damage those and it needs roots below ground 
to feed that bud and you can divide those up and produce many, many rhubarb plants from this one. Um, one thing also that you can do with divisions, instead of digging up this whole clump, I could come with a sharp shovel and just cut off a chunk and maybe take that out and plant a few plants rather than you don't have to necessarily always dig up the whole uh, clump and divide it all up. Sometimes you can just carefully cut off a chunk and replant one or two or three more plants somewhere else rather than digging the whole thing up. Grafting. So grafting is something that I'm especially fond of. Um, and you can kind of think about it like it's Frankenstein plant surgery. So grafting, in essence, it's pretty simple. You have two parts. You got what's called the cyan wood, S-C-I-O-N, cyan. And that is the part that is going to produce the, the top part of the plant, which will make the fruit uh, or the, the upper part of the plant that you want, usually if we're talking about fruit trees. And then you have the rootstock, which is the bottom part, and that will be the roots of the plant. And essentially you're cutting them so that they, they mesh and they grow together. And in order to do that, you have to line up the bark on the cyan wood with the bark on the rootstock. And then you have to tie them together so they won't be interrupted while they heal. And then you have to completely wrap them and cover them up so that moisture won't escape. Because if you just left it like this, this little twig right here, this is just a fresh twig, this would dry out and die. And you get your cyan wood from an already producing fruit tree. And so if you, if you do your graft and do everything right, uh, including they put a bag on here to keep the sun off of it for a few days, if you do everything right, then the top part of the plant will be exactly genetically identical to the fruit tree that you got it from. And the bottom part of the plant will just be a healthy root system from whatever was growing there before, whatever your rootstock is. Uh, they tend to produce a lot quicker than a plant grown from seed. So for instance, a plum that is uh, grafted can produce in two to three years. A plum from seed could take 10 to 12 years. Um, the, the cyan wood and the rootstock do need to be close relatives. They need to be the same species or thereabouts. Um, but other than that, uh, it's kind of magical. And the last propagation technique we're going to talk about is layering and air layering. Now they're related. Um, Layering I talked about earlier, it's when you have a branch of a tree that's usually one that's already close to the ground, leaning over, and you're going to bend it down so it's touching the ground. You may peel a little strip of the bark like you can see right here. You may peel that off and lay that peeled section under the dirt and then put a rock, or in this case they pinned it down with like some big ground staples. Um, but you want to get that section of the branch under the dirt and then also have another section that's growing out of the dirt so it can produce new leaves. And you just got to wait, wait for it to form roots underground. And then once it has a really good root system, then you can cut it away from the mother plant and you have a new plant. Now, this picture shows compound grafting, which means you're making several plants out of this one branch. Now you could cut this away and make one, two, three different trees from this one branch. And then theoretically you can dig that up and plant that somewhere else or dig it up and put it in a pot. Uh, air layering is essentially doing this but not having to bend the branch down to the ground. Instead, you are cutting away a strip of the bark and what this does is it stimulates this little spot right here to make roots. And then you're wrapping something around it, usually a damp peat moss, and then wrapping that in plastic or actually aluminum foil is my favorite thing to do for this. And so you're wrapping damp peat moss around it and wrapping that in aluminum foil, and then you're waiting. It usually takes about three months 
and then this will fill with roots and then you can cut it away from the mother tree and then put it in uh, take off the foil and plant that root ball in a pot and then you have a new tree that's identical to the mother tree that you got it from so in conclusion Perennials are long-lived crops that can be more sustainable than annual crops. Some of their unique needs are periodic feeding with compost, fertilizer, and mulch. Unlike annual crops, perennial crops we do have to feed periodically because we're not fertilizing the soil in preparation for a garden bed. We are, in fact, uh, feeding a plant that's producing year after year for us. Consistent and thorough harvesting. Uh, with certain crops, right? And that can prevent um, pests and disease and uh, increase the longevity of the plant. Not over harvesting, especially when we're talking about leaf, stem, uh, specifically when we're talking about leaf, stem, and shoot crops, right? The fruiting crops, we don't really have to worry about over harvesting because the plant is freely giving away all that fruit. It wants to let it go. With the stem, flower, and shoot crops, we're taking away the energy, the photosynthesizing part of the plant. They often require structural, vegetative, or seasonal pruning, right? Not all of them, but a lot of them, a lot of perennials do. And we also want to pay attention to and learn about uh, pollination, what, what kind of pollination we need for our fruiting crops. You want to know about that ahead of time and plan for that. All right. I hope uh, this was good. I hope you guys learned a lot about perennial crops.